I don't respond to a lot of Muslims, not because I can't, but because there really aren't a lot of Muslim videos out there worth responding to. On YouTube, Christianity rules the roost when it comes to religion. And I want to change that, so I found a couple of Muslim videos that I'll be responding to in the future, and the first one is a video by Asra Rashid calling for atheists to think about three propositions before debating with Muslims. Great, let's see what you got. Now, I'm going to say something that Muslims or Christians or other theists won't pay any attention to at all. But I've seen a lot of videos out there where the religious try to set conditions for having religious discussions. They're only willing to talk about religion so far as they can do so on their own terms. What if atheists set their own conditions, like no unsupported claims, we can only discuss things that can be objectively proven, etc.? How many theists would pay you any mind? So I'm not sure why so many theists think they get to set the rules for discussion. But let's see what he has to say. This is a message for the atheists to consider certain propositions before discussing with a Muslim. Now those propositions... Inconvenient jump cut is inconvenient. ...are proposition number one, that we cannot have something coming into existence simply because of the principle of determination. In other words, they hold some things on faith, and in order to have a conversation with them, you have to accept that their blind faith is true. Yeah, I don't think so. What do we mean by the principle of determination? If there are two options, A and B, existence and non-existence, someone would have to have come along and chosen the proposition of existence over non-existence, therefore we exist. So this is proposition number one. Well, that means a whole lot of nothing. There's a ton of blind faith in that statement that we really need to unpack. First off, engaging in a false dichotomy between existence and non-existence without defining your terms. What does any of that even mean? Second, asserting that someone, not something, but someone, made the determination between existence and non-existence. Says who? That's just a blind faith assertion that has not been justified. In other words, in order to debate with a Muslim, you have to accept their beliefs are true. This is not going well. And this would be very logical to any Muslim theologian and Muslim layman. Well, not to anyone with a clue in their head. And since you're talking to atheists, why do you think they would accept Muslim propositions? Try again. Proposition number two for the atheist to consider is the impossibility of continuous regress. Hey, great. So what caused Allah? Because you haven't solved the problem that everything has to be caused by something. You've just arbitrarily chosen this God thing that you want to believe exists and imbued it with special powers because it solves your problems. But hey, we can make things up too. We can just say that before this universe came another universe, and on and on and on, until we can make up a primordial universe that existed forever and created all universes that came afterwards. We won't do that because we're honest, but what makes you think your unsupported assertions are any better than ours would be? So what do we mean by continuous regress? That something is caused by something else, so we will say A is caused by B, and then B is caused by C, and then C is caused by D, ad infinitum, meaning forever. This, Muslim theologians will say, is an impossibility. Why would I care what any Muslims say? I'm not interested in who says a thing. I'm interested in what you can support with objectively demonstrable and verifiable evidence. And in the absence of such, I'm not going to take your word for anything. 
And that's what science does. It looks at the evidence, and if it can't draw a conclusion, it doesn't make up an emotionally comforting explanation. It says, we don't know, and it keeps looking into it. Maybe you should try that. And proposition number three is the, the impossibility of circular reasoning. Religion is based on circular reasoning. Now, I'm going to take a little jaunt into Christianity for this because the graphic is so readily available, but you can do the same thing with Islam. The Bible is true because the Bible says it's the word of God, and since it's the word of God, it has to be true. Around and around and around you go, where you find reason, and nobody knows. The problem is no one has ever proven that any of those propositions are true. It's just belief piled on belief piled on belief with no intellectual justification at all. What do we mean by circular reasoning if we say A caused B and B caused A and therefore A caused B and B caused A? I'm sorry. But if A equals B, then by definition, B equals A. You can't have it any other way. It's basic mathematics. How can you not be aware of that? Or if we say A equals B and B equals C and C equals B, uh, C equals A and then A equals B and then B equals C. That's also a mathematical certainty. You can't even get elementary school math right. Is it any wonder we don't take you seriously? This would be something rationally impossible. No, it's something rationally certain. These three things are very important for any atheist willing to debate a Muslim theologian to refute. I already did them all, thanks. But the one thing I'm sure he'd refuse to do is try to refute any of the atheist positions because he isn't interested in truth only in holding his emotionally comforting beliefs to the exclusion of all else. Either you agree with these three propositions, and if you do agree, then the conversation or the debate can go ahead. And if, we, if you decide to disagree with these propositions, then either the propositions are debated in of themselves, or you reach an impasse in the debate where the debate cannot continue. In other words, agree with us or we won't debate with you. And that's really where so many religious debates with Muslims or otherwise just break down. They have their unjustified assertions that they refuse to debate and anyone who refuses to agree on their assertions gets rejected out of hand and they just declare victory. This is why religious debate is so pointless most of the time. They're right. And if you disagree, you're wrong because they're right, so there. So I would like to see the response of our atheist audience with regard to these three propositions. And after this, I will also uh, propose 15 different fallacies of atheists when discussing with Muslims. Oh, that should be fun, considering that these three propositions were so easily dismissed as fallacious. I mean, seriously, I feel like I'm talking to children when I address these videos. These arguments are just that ridiculous. Now, he did put up that video on fallacies, and I will address it down the road. But if this is the quality of argument that I can expect from this Muslim apologist, I just don't hold out much hope. And that's really how all apologists I deal with operate. They're right. Therefore, everyone else is wrong because they're right. Lather, rinse, and repeat ad nauseum. They can't actually prove that they're right. It's just an assertion made on emotion and held tightly to such an absurd degree that to even suggest that there's something wrong with their reasoning is enough to declare heresy. And we all know what Muslim-majority countries tend to do with heretics. Because whether they like it or not, they can't actually prove any of this. They have no objective evidence to support any of their claims. But because they're so emotionally attached to their faith, the very possibility that it's wrong or can be challenged is unacceptable. Therefore, where they can't control the facts, they make sure they can shut up their critics, often permanently. 
Of course, I'm not suggesting that this particular Muslim is like that or holds those views, but it's undeniable that many are. Forget the truth, wield the sword, silence detractors. It's unfortunately the way things tend to work in the religious world.